chapter 27 tonight, and we're kind of getting close to the end of the book. Another short chapter, um, but I think there's some things we can glean from this tonight, some important things, some important lessons that we can learn about um, even great men, of, the fact that even great men of God like David, you know, from time to time have a lapse of faith, and I, and I do believe that's what's going on here in the story. Um, you know, people might have a different opinion about that, and I, and I could definitely, uh, you know, see both sides of it, but... I mean, the, the, it's kind of surprising to see David do what he does here, given the fact that he's had so many times uh, where God has delivered him from the hand of Saul. You know, he's having the dart, you know, the, the spear thrust at him more than once. He dodges out of the way. He, you know, he goes, gets so bold, in fact, even to the point where he confronts Saul, uh, like we read about last week. And in spite of all that, and in fact, in fact, in spite of the fact that Saul, at the end of the chapter last week, if you remember, he told him, you know, I, I know you're going to succeed, basically, is what he said, in everything that you do, that you're, you're righteous and that you're going to, uh, you know, get the victory. He, he, he knew that. In spite of the fact that even, even having heard those words out of Saul, David takes off and he goes and he land, dwells in the land of the Philistines, which is surprising given the fact that, if you remember, he's the one that slew champion of Gath, uh, who was Goliath. And... He goes and, and dwells in, in, in their land. And it just goes to show us that even great men of God, you know, can have a lapse in faith sometime. And, and we could even think about other examples, you know, say, well, is that really what's going on here in the story? Wouldn't be that surprising given the fact that you see that happen with other men of God. I mean, think about Peter, you know, who said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, professed Christ, you know, believed on Christ, served alongside Christ, witnessed many miracles. But even he has a lapse in faith. You know, he walks out and he, you know, walks on the water and he and he ends up sinking and crying out on the Lord and even denies the Lord at one point. So, uh, you know, great men of God can have a lapse of faith. John the Baptist, you know, would be another great example. And we're talking about the guy who baptized Christ. You saw the heavens open and the Spirit of God descend upon Christ himself. You know, even he, when he would face hard times, when he was you know, put into a corner in prison and sent people unto Christ say, asking him, art thou him or should we seek another? You know, and he had, you know, and, and what's the, the you know, the, the common thread here that we see between these examples of David and Peter and John, or John the Baptist, is that these lapses of faith happened when things weren't going very well. You know, it's really easy to say, I'm faithful, I'm never going to falter, I'm, always, I'm never going to deny God, I'm always going to be uh, you know, just this faithful, stalwart, you know, just bulwark of the faith at all times when you're on the mountaintop. You know, when everything's going great, when there's no persecution, when things are going easy. But that's not really a trying of your faith. You know, the trying of your faith is when you go through persecution, when you are in difficult circumstances, like John the Baptist was, you know, facing execution in prison, like, you know, Peter, where he was, you know, potentially going to be dragged into Pilate's, or, uh, you know, the, the, the Pharisees' court along with Christ. And, you know, and here with David, who's on the run again, who's just been on the run for a long time now, running from Saul, hearing a lot of the same things from Saul, saying, you know, Saul saying, hey, you know, you're, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm, you're righteous, I'm not. But then he goes right back to pursuing him. You know, David was in his own, going his own trial, his own tribulation. So it's really not as surprising as it might seem at first. When you see a man like David, who has been under God's protection you know, uh, uh, going and running from Saul to the land of the Philistines. <clears throat> so what that should show us is the fact that, you know, men of God are still men of God. You know, it's, it's always important to remember that. You know, we don't, of course, we want to honor them and respect them and so on and so forth. But let's always remember that they're not perfect. Okay, because again, they're just men. Men of God are still men. You know, and, and, and we've never been, we, it's easy to criticize David now, isn't it? It's easy to look back on David and say, well, that's not what I would have done. Well, I can't believe David did that. You know, but we really don't know exactly what was going on. We weren't in David's shoes. You know, we don't know how we would have reacted. It, would we have done the same thing you know, if we were David? We can hypothesize and we can think about it. But at the end of the day, you know, David... Is, the man, is a man of God, and you know what? He, I believe he has a little bit of a lapse of faith here. And he goes and does something, because again, this is another, uh, another principle in Scripture, another example of the principle, rather, 
that there is the statement and then there is the story. This is a Bible story about what happened. This isn't God, just because it's in the Bible, condoning of what happened or saying that is what he wanted. Okay, but it is what happened. You know, we think, and we can think of other examples where we've seen people falter in their faith and waver, and 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 when they when it just seems like why why are why are you having such a hard time? Understand? I mean, I think about you know the children of Israel when they're going to cross the Red Sea. I mean, they just came out of Egypt after all those plagues of Egypt, after seeing the firstborn killed, after being given all the jewels and everything, and told to go. And being delivered miraculously from the hand of Pharaoh by, you know, by, through a strong hand, through the, you know, the miracles that, that Moses uh, did through God. You know, they go from that, then they face the Red Sea where they're closed in, and then it's all of a sudden we're here to perish. You know, we're here to die. And then even after that, they get out in the wilderness and they run out of water or something like that. You know, or they, they get tired of having to eat the manna and they murmur and complain. A whole nation of people who saw great things that God did. They saw God come down in a pillar of fire upon the mount and speak to them and, and all of that. Even, even then, even when people have had these experiences, you would say, they should know better. Even people then will have lapses in faith. And really, David here, you know, he, it seems like he's just kind of out of options. You know, he's probably a little bit tired of having to be on the land, constantly running, constantly being on the move. Maybe he's just thinking, you know what, I'm just going to go into the Philistines and, and I'm just going to settle down there. Because if we read there, you know, he does say, you know, I'll escape out of his hand and at the end of verse uh, 1. But it says that David, uh, uh, David arose and passed over with 600 men that were with him to Achish. And I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but the point is this. He goes there and he asks for him, to, you know, he asks uh, Achish for a city. You know, he asks for him to give him uh, that, that land that he can, he can go and dwell there. So it looks like David's kind of settling in. Maybe David in his heart, you know, has just resigned himself to the fact that, you know, Saul's going to continue to reign until he dies a natural death, you know, and it's just going to wait things out in the land of the Philistines. And, and it's, it's hard to know exactly what's going through David's mind, but you can see through his actions that this isn't exactly uh, what you would expect from somebody who has, you know, had the God's hand on them like he has. <clears throat> now, I do want to point out a few other things. It won't be a real long sermon tonight, but if you look there in verse 2, it says, And David arose, and he passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David dwelt in Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. So, these 600 men are coming with them, but remember, it says also that they brought with them every man his household. So they're bringing their wives, they're bringing their children. Now, I don't know that they were with them while they're running around the mountains, you know, from Saul. The impression that I get from reading this is that David goes over in the land of the Philistines, and then they all call for their families to come to them, which again would show you that, you know, they're going there kind of resigning themselves to you know dwelling in that land maybe almost on a permanent basis maybe david's kind of throwing in the towel a little bit and he's going in there and you know i could be wrong but this is just you know my take on it this is what i get out of the story he goes over there but what i'd like to point out is the fact that the 600 men that he started out with him are still with him the 600 men that started out and were faithful to david they continue to be faithful to david now i don't know that they all agreed with what david was doing you know, some of them might have been scratching their heads saying, why are we going to the land of Philistines? You know, why don't we stay here and let God deliver us? So on and so forth. They might not have all agreed with the decision that David had made, but what's great about these 600 men is that they remained loyal. Okay? Now, obviously, there's a time where we have to, you know, where loyalty becomes blind loyalty, where we don't want to follow people into sin. We don't want to follow leadership or, uh, you know, when they're doing something wicked or preaching some kind of blasphemy. You know, there is a line that gets drawn in the sand, okay? I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that, you know, even in instances like this where the man of God isn't maybe making the best decision, or maybe, uh, you know, they, the men that are following him wouldn't agree with what he's doing, they're saying to themselves, but you know what? David's still a man of God. Let's just follow him and see how things turn out. And see how things go. They're over. They can look overlook some things, and we should be the same way. 
you know, we should be faithful uh, to people in our lives and be willing to excuse bad decisions or maybe things, maybe not even bad decisions, just differences of opinion or even things that they we just perceive or think are are wrong. Okay, and again, the, you know, we draw a line at sin, we draw a line at you know false doctrine, so on and so forth. We understand that. You know, a great example of this would be marriage. You know, I mean, think about the loyalty that is supposed to be there between uh, spouses. You know, now, newsflash, you know, I'm not perfect, okay? I know that comes as a shock to everybody tonight, you know, and it, it came as a real shock to my wife. You know, after a, a little bit of marriage, she got into it. Actually, it wasn't even that long. <laughs> she found out, you know, her knight in shining armor, you know, there was some rust on that armor. There were some, there were some kinks in the armor. And it wasn't, you know, I had some flaws, you know, and vice versa, you know, and, and that's the way it's going to be in every marriage. You know, nobody's perfect, but you know what? We should still be loyal. You know, we should still be loyal to our spouses, even though they're not perfect in every way, or they do something that we disagree with, or so on and so forth. Okay, there's still, we should follow them, we should lead them, we should be loyal to them, because of the fact that, you know, that that's an important attribute to have. And these men here, I believe, are displaying that. Even the point where they're saying, let's get our families and let's go over to the Philistines with David. Okay? Now, maybe it's just because there's nothing else there for them. Maybe, you know, in Israel, they were just, you know, they were kind of outlaws at this point. But no doubt, the fact that he had all 600 still with him goes to show you that these were loyal people. And if you would, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. So these 600 men, you know, they remain loyal to David. And you have to remember, they weren't just loyal to David when, when, when in, in David's, you know, uh, greatest, easiest season of his life. They came to David when David was put out, when David's running from Saul. That's when they came and found David. And they stuck with David through sleeping out in the cold, you know, not knowing where the next meal's coming from, being hunted by 3,000 chosen men of war by Saul. You know, they're, they're being loyal to David through the hard times. And really, that's the best way to test loyalty. In fact, that's really the only way to know if people are loyal, is, if when, is when you go through a difficult time. You know, we can talk about this with, with friendships. You know, people can say, oh, you know, I'm friends with this person, so-and-so is my friend, but as soon as that person goes through some trial or tribulation, you know, that's like, oh, I don't know who this is. I know not the man, you know, because we don't want to share in their burden at all. We don't want to have to go through what they're, you know, experience anything about what they're going through. But that's not the case with these, these 600 men. And, and what I believe these men are showing us is that, you know, there's never an acceptable time to quit on God. There's never an acceptable time to quit on God. Even if man fails you, and man will fail you, even if and when man fails you to some degree or another, you know, that does not become your excuse to quit on God. And so many people do this. I've seen this so many times in my Christian life where, where everything, the people are just, it's like they're just waiting it out. They're just waiting for their spiritual excuse to, to, to quit church, to quit living for God, to quit on the Lord, and just go back to the world and, and just get back into whatever they're doing or pursue some, you know, worldly pursuit in their life and not, no longer serve God. And what they'll do is that, because, you know, they want to try and save face, instead of just admitting, I'm backslidden, I don't want to serve God, I don't want to live for the Lord, I'm just going to go back to the world. And they, and they don't even have enough character to do that. What they do is they sit back and they wait for a circumstance, they wait for, you know, somebody in the church or the pastor or, you know, whatever to make a mistake or do something wrong. They don't agree with them. They go, aha, see, I can't serve God here. This place is, you know, you know, you shut down for coronavirus. I can't go to church here anymore, compromiser, you know, and then they're out of here, you know, and that kind of thing happens. And uh, people, but here's the thing, there is never an acceptable time or circumstance to quit on God. Look, even if you had to come to the place of, you know, you just couldn't go to this church anymore. And you just say, you know, Brother Corbin, he's just, he's always wearing the same blue shirt. You know, I just can't take it anymore. I got to go somewhere else. You know, or even if you had the legitimate, you know, seemingly legitimate excuse, you know, you just didn't agree with the doctrine or what, you didn't like the way you do things, you know, that's fine. You can go to another church and continue to serve God. But what happens so often is people just, they have a bad experience at one church 
or it's not even necessarily a bad experience. And even if it was a bad experience, they go somewhere, they see something they don't like, they see something they don't agree with, and then they just quit altogether. It's not, they don't go find a better church. They don't go and find somewhere else to serve God. They just quit serving God altogether. You know, not the case with these 600 men that followed David. They were loyal to him when it counted most. And the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times. A friend loveth at all times. You know, we've all heard the expression, fair weather friends. You know, it, you know, it's really easy to be friends with people when you can gain a lot from that friendship. When it's, you know, and, and by the way, that's not a real friendship. When, when friendship is all one-sided, that's not, you can really call it friendship. You know, friendship is give and take. You know, you help me, you know, I help you. And it's not because I owe you one, it's just because that's what friends do for one another. You know, they help each other out, you know. And, you know, Lord willing, we'll be moving, you know, in a few weeks or months, you know. So just keep that in mind when, when we bring all our first around. But uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, that's, a, that's a kind of, you know, that's a modern example that's a, you know, that we could use. You know, friends help each other move. You know, friends help each other, you know, fix cars or do repairs or ladies help one another, you know, with, with whatever they do. <laughs> the homeschooling and so on and so forth, the child rearing. You know, they bounce things off each other. They give advice. That's, that's what friends do. They love at all times. You know, don't, it's not this thing of, oh, you got a problem? Come back to me when you figure it out. We'll be friends again. You know, friends are there. The Bible says that they love it at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we should have each other's back when? At all times. Amen. Even in adversity. And, uh, you know, this is important to remember because all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, and it's only a matter of time as long as we keep preaching the word and doing the work that we're supposed to do that devil, until, you know, that the devil takes notice. You know, we have our own bouts here. We have our own uh, trials and tribulations in our personal lives or even this church, you know. And might as well just go ahead and prime the pump now, you know, if and when this church ever faces any kind of persecution, you know, that's the time to, to, to be loyal. Yep. And that is not the time to quit on God. That is not the time to deny, you know, the preacher. That's not the time to, to you know, run and hide and wait for the, the storm to blow over. That's the time to show up, to show support, and, and be in the fight. You know, we, we probably everyone in the room is familiar with what's going on out in Faith, uh, First Works Baptist Church in El, El Monte, mm -hmm. past Bruce Mejia. I mean, they are being protested by just the most degenerate, vile elements of society. Okay, if we're to, you know, and, and, and if you've, you've been paying attention to that online, you already know kind of what's going on. You know, man of God gets up and preaches a sermon against the homos and says, you know, preaches what the Bible says and, you know, it triggers these, these freaks out there. And they got their petition going and now they're showing up at his church and even to the point now where they're planning a drag like, the, to literally have a drag queen show in front of this church. And if you've been there, I mean, their sidewalk isn't much wider than the sidewalk in front of here. And, you know, I was talking to Pastor here today, and there's basically a thin blue line right there on the ground. That's where they can stand and on that side, and, and then they're right there. But, I mean, it's like they're right here. I mean, imagine having to go to church and having drag queen that far from you as you're trying to go through the door. And they're doing all kinds of other things. Being a distraction, driving by, honking horns. They even brought in a live death metal band, you know, and they, they, they are, are, are playing the most blasphemous, filthy, vile things, making threats, you know. And, and you know what, Pastor Mejia, he's, he's will, ready, willing, and able to go through it and have no doubt about the fact that he's going to remain faithful and stand his ground and continue to preach. But that doesn't mean it's easy. You know, people kind of get this idea that. Well, you know, the preacher, he, he's, he said it all, and, and uh, you know, obviously he's this great, you know, uh, you know, man of God. He's this great, you know, beacon of the faith or whatever, but he's still a man. And I'm not saying, you know, Pastor, you know, I don't know everything that's going on. I, I know enough to know that he's, he's going to continue, you know, and he's going to continue to take the stand that he's taken. He's not going to back down. But I'm not, all I'm saying is this, is that that doesn't mean it's easy for somebody, you know. And I, I've never personally been, you know, the, 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 in the spotlight or that kind of thing, but I've known people that have. You know, I've known Pastor Mejia, Pastor Anderson, uh, Pastor Menez, you know, Pastor Dave Burzins, 
Pastor uh, Aaron Thompson, Pastor Jonathan Shelley, you know, and others in the past who have who have faced that persecution, who have been the object of scrutiny by the, the local media, you know, and, and the, the, the local sodomite, you know, faction that wants to show up and protest. You know, they, they go after one person. Not to say that other people don't suffer, that they aren't being threatened, that they don't have other things to go on in there, but you know, one thing I always remember is this, is that when everything, anything ever happens like that, and I've, and I've kind of been alongside for the ride and these kind of things go on, is that, uh, you know, there is an element of collateral damage. You know, there's, you know, like when a bomb hits, shrapnel kind of flies, you know what I mean? But typically the way it works is the bomb lands in the pastor's lap. You know, they're the ones that are bearing the brunt of it. So the, why I'm bringing all that up to say this, you know, when a brother is born for adversity, a friend loveth at all times, you know, it's great to have your pastor's back, but it's great to let him know you have his back when he's going through something like this, you know, when there is adversity. And, and, and people, I think, sometimes get this idea like, oh, they're the pastor, they can handle it, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's part of the job, you know, they signed up for it. And that's true. But that doesn't that you know what they you know what they're still human. Just I mean that's what it's going on here. David David's still just a flawed man like anybody else. He still you know you know tickle him does he not laugh? Prick him does he not bleed? <laughs> He's still flesh and blood. He still you know has the same temptations and trials that anybody else would. You know they don't have superpowers. So we should endeavor to be you know we might not ever be in the position of a David where we're leading the charge. You know, we're bearing the brunt. But, you know, we could, we could all be part of that 600. Or we could all be a part of the 600 and say, you know what? I'll go with you into the mountains. I'll go with you and be pursued by the enemy. I'll go with you and, and suffer out there, uh, you know, in the wilderness. Yes, I'll go with you in the land of the enemy and dwell with you and be there and support you and help you. You know, that is when loyalty counts the most. Not when it's just, you know, easy. When everything's going great, that that that's uh, <clears throat> you know that that that's the easy way of doing things. Look at there at Second Timothy chapter one verse seven. The Bible says in verse seven, "For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind." You know, it's interesting that Paul even has to bring this up. What are you talking about? God hasn't given a spirit. What do we have to be afraid of? I mean, that is the the, the question we answer. But people would scratch their heads and read when they read that and say. You mean there's potential that there might be something be worth being fearful over? Yeah, it happens. You know, we all want to think that if I had to walk that picket line, if I had to walk through that protest, man, I, you know, it'd be no problem. You know, if if I was in, you know, if I was in the Great Tribulation, you know, I'd be I'd be loyal in the death. You know, I wouldn't have sunk like Peter did. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have sent. I would have taken my beheading like a man, John the Baptist. You know, I wouldn't have fled into the... We all want to think that. But you know what? It's until we're really in these positions, until we really go through that, we really can't say that about ourselves. Now, we can hope. We can determine. We can say, you know what? No matter how I feel in that moment, I'm going to remain loyal. And you know what? Fear is a natural reaction. You know, that's a natural reaction. To feel fear. And God, the Bible saying here, look, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So if we're feeling that emotion, if we're feeling that, that didn't come from God. That's our flesh. That's the devil. Whatever. He says he has not given a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. And this is what people understand is that, you know, Paul is saying here, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. I mean, he's saying, look, Timothy... If you tell people, hey, you know, you know, are you the guy? You're that guy that followed Paul around. You're the you're the protege of Paul. Isn't he in jail right now? Because I mean, if you go to jail, it's kind of a negative connotation of that. People instantly assume the worst. They never it never dawns on them that you know sometimes people are jailed unjustly. Right? Sometimes innocent people go there, or sometimes they go there over bogus laws. Right? But they're saying here, look, don't be afraid of of of, of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed of the fact that, you know, Timothy, that your preacher is in jail right now. That's what he's saying. That I am bound for Christ. Don't let that, you know, be, well, you know, I knew Paul, but that was before he, you know, went out of jail. I don't think he was now. 
You know, we should own that. You know, don't don't be ashamed of your preacher when he's on the eleven o'clock news. You know, get, getting you know lambasted by the the you know the local news anchor. You know, and they usually do a pretty poor job at it. But you know, don't be ashamed of that. When they find out at work, hey, I was watching the news last night. And don't you go to that church? Uh, 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 I'm taking a few weeks off. Yeah, I go there, but I, I didn't know. And look, people quit over things like that. People, things like that happen. These protests happen. The spotlight gets shown on there. You know, it gets shown on some church and, 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 and made out to be whatever. And people go running for the hills. And they never come back. It happens all the time. You know what that? You know what that means? It's like those people were not born for adversity. That they were not. They did not love at all times. That they were ashamed of the man of God. You know, Paul's telling telling Timothy very specifically, be not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of being his prisoner. Now, look, if if the preacher or somebody does something that you know they wind up in jail, and it's a for a shameful reason, you know they're caught embezzling or stealing or committing adultery, or whatever. I mean, there are times when we ought to be ashamed of somebody. Obviously, right? We, You know, we draw the line. But Paul is saying here, be not ashamed of, of being his prisoner. Why? Because of the testimony of our Lord. That is why Paul was going through what he went through. It wasn't because Paul was a bad guy who's worthy of, you know, being shunned and avoided and disassociated from. He's being persecuted because of the fact that that he held the testimony of our Lord. You know, he was he was counted a troublemaker because of the fact that he preached Christ. You know, and he, that's the difference. You know, and if you say, well, should I be ashamed of this guy? Should I be afraid? Should I not be associated? Well, is what he's saying biblical or not? That's what you have to ask yourself. Is what's coming out of his mouth, the things that he's saying and preaching, are they true? Are they scriptural? And if the answer is yes, then be loyal. Yeah. Then remain loyal and don't be ashamed. You know, and that's the time to back people up, not to run away with your tail between your legs. He's saying that be not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me as prisoner. You say, well, I can do that. You know, I'm going to do that. Okay, great. I'm, I hope that's the case. But just go on and read the rest of the verse. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, being loyal, is, is, it might come at a price. You know, it might be they might go. Well, let's let's find out who everybody is in that church. In that church is. Let's get everybody's personal information online. Let's contact everybody's employer. You know. Let's see uh, how much havoc we can wreak on you know the congregant's life. That kind of thing goes on. That kind of thing happens. So we could say, oh, I'm not going to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. I'm not going to be ashamed of the prisoner who's being persecuted for Christ's sake. But you know what? That that's good. But just remember, if you're if that you're going to go there, then you have to also be willing to be partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And look, if we're suffering for the gospel's sake, if we're suffering for the word of God's sake, you know what? The Bible says we should leap for joy. We should count it all joy when men persecute us. Amen. When they say all men of evil against us falsely, we should rejoice in that day, the Bible says. Go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, go to... You're, you're already there. Uh, I'll read to you from chapter 4 where it says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by the preaching, that the, by me the preaching might be fully known, and all the gentle Gentiles might hear. If you're in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, let's look there at verse uh, 15. He said, This thou knowest that they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom it are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord uh, give mercy in the house of on, on Nisiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. You know, there's there's some people here getting named, right? There's, you know, Phygelus and Hermogenes. And what, you know, are they going down in, in the eternal written word of God and being lifted up as these loyal, faithful individuals? who love Paul no matter what? No, they're going down. It's kind of a, it's a blemish on their reputation. You know, I don't, I'm don't. i assuming these are saved guys, you know, that these guys are going to be in heaven. You know, you're going to meet them in heaven. Hey, I'm, I'm, brother, I'm brother Corbin. What's your name? I'm Fredo. 
that by jealous? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm Brian Corbin. What's your name? I'm Roger Denise. You know, that, that's, that'd be a shameful thing. Look, we don't want to get to heaven and have that side of us. Oh, what'd you do? Oh, I forsook the man of God. I was ashamed of the prisoner of Christ. I, would, I did not want to be willing to be a partaker of the affliction of the gospel of Christ. That's my testimony in heaven. You know, and that's eternal. Just like these guys are eternal. Their, their names are there forever. They're going to have to live with that forever. You know, and if people make these mistakes and people do these things, of course, you know, we forgive. You know, and we don't hold it over their heads, but it's kind of like, well, you know, you did do that <laughs> at the same time. But you want to be like Onesiphorus, right? The Lord give mercy in the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So this guy, not only was he loyal, but he actually went looking for the man of God so that he could refresh him, you know, so that he could be a blessing to him. And, you know, that's an important thing to keep in mind, is when we see brethren that are being persecuted, that are going, that are suffering, the cause of Christ, you know, we should seek them out and refresh them. Yeah. And it could be the simplest of things. You know, it could be a Facebook post. People put that up. You know, I stand with so-and-so or whatever. Give them a call. Just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying about you. If there's anything you need, just let me know. You know, as long as we're sincere, you know, we mean these things. You know, that those little things can be such a huge refreshment to somebody who's going through that. Just to know that somebody's got your back. I mean, just think about it. Paul here, he's saying, look, at my first answer, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. I mean, if you're in that kind of position, don't you think somebody coming and finding you would be refreshing? Somebody coming just saying, hey, I sought you out very diligently. You know, is there anything I could do for you, Paul? I'm with you. I haven't forsaken you. I mean, that's a pretty refreshing. You'd say, how, how is that refreshing? Well, when nobody's standing with you, when all men have forsaken you, when they all be turned away from you, you know, when one person seeks you out and gives you that word of encouragement or, you know, offers a helping hand or just lets you know that we're praying for you or whatever, you know, that can be a real source of refreshment for people that are going through that, that time of tribulation. And look, it's not fun to go through the kinds of things like what they're experiencing out at First Works today in Omani. It, you know, we, we look at it sometimes and it's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, let them fags have it. And look. I'm sure they're 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 glad they're more than willing and able to go through the persecution. But I'm telling you, as somebody who's who's seen it firsthand, as somebody who has gone through it to some degree, and look, the protests that I've been through up at Faithful Word, I mean, there was a buffer at least. At least they were over there. You know, they were they weren't within arm's reach. You know, when I was in Vancouver, they're they're right outside the door. You know. We think, oh, that would be so cool if we could go through that, get some notoriety or something like that. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for because it's not all it's cracked up to be. I mean, I'm sure if we were to ask the people there today, hey, would you rather not have a drag queen show up for your, your, your church on Sunday? They would probably all say, yeah, no thanks. No one would say, yeah, we'll bring it on, you know. It's not as, you know, so here's what I'm saying is that when we, we see people going through that, when we see people suffering that, you know, it's it's great that we think well of them, but maybe we should let them know. Say, hey, I'm with you. You know, I, I, I stand with you. I, I'm there. And you know, it's unfortunate when you see people who claim to be other people's friends and they, they don't stand up. They don't say anything. They, they don't make it. You just say, well, you know. That's going on over there. Well, you know what? I, hopefully nobody has that attitude about you if it ever happens in your life. You know, of course, we're talking about a very specific example with what's going on right now because it's relevant. But, you know, this could be the same just in our lives in general. You know, when we're going through life and we face some kind of persecution or trial or tribulation, we see another brother or sister going through that. You know, we should be mindful of the fact that that might be us one day. You know, and if I were in their shoes, boy, it would really be a blessing to me if somebody sent me a card or let me know that they gave me a phone call or a text, you know, at least let me know that they're thinking about me. You know, that would go a long way. It would refresh people, in fact. Are you still in 2 Timothy? Uh, where the hell do you go? We already read all that. Okay. Let's move on here. And go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27. So that's kind of what's going on in the story. 
right? We see Paul, or excuse me, uh, uh, David is, you know, I believe having a little bit of a lapse in faith, kind of throwing a towel a little bit, kind of resigning himself, just, you know, I'm, I'm tired of running around the wilderness. I'm just going to go settle down, even if it's in the land of the Philistines. And these 600 men are remaining loyal to him. I mean, think about how lame that would have been to have been loyal through everything that they've been loyal through, and then at this point quit. And then just, eh, forget it. You know, that, that always amazes me when, when, when I see that happen, when people that are, you know, they'll go through this trial, they'll go through this tribulation, they'll, they'll pay this price, they, you know, they're, they're loyal, they're loyal, and then they just, they reach a breaking point. And it's like, well, then all that was for naught. All of that was for naught. <clears throat> so David, he's running. They bring all their families. It says in verse 4, And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought him no more. So not that we're probably any uh, really wondering about Saul, but this, you know, it's worth pointing out here in light of everything that's going on, is that this goes to show us that Saul was not an implacable reprobate, okay? Because when he heard he'd gone to land of the Philistines, it says he sought him no more. He said, okay, well, he's not around anymore. One, it also shows us that David's suspicions were right about Saul, right? And Saul's given him this, this speech at the end of, you know, last week's chapter, chapter 26, where he says, you know, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt both do great things and shalt prevail. You know, he's giving David this blessing, and but then David goes to the land of the Philistines. Anyways, why? Because David knows better. He's learned what Saul's like. It's, you know, you throw a dart at me, you, you apologize, and then the next day it's the spear again. You know, it's, that's, it's, a, it's a pattern with you, Saul. So this just goes to show you that Saul or David's suspicions were right. You know, that he didn't, he went on his own way. He didn't return into his own land because it says he sought him no more, no more again for him. Meaning that had he stuck around, he probably would have. But it also shows us that Saul's not implacable. That there's a certain line that he's not going to cross, you know. And that's what a lot of these people need to figure out about these fags and these homos. Is that they are implacable. Go read Romans 1. They, they are implacable. They cannot be placated. And that's why I just... I'd laugh when I hear about this mayor out there in Almonte saying, oh, you know, we're just going to get both sides. We're going to get Pastor Mejia to, get, to sit down. And we're going to get everybody at the table. And we're going to talk about, you know, all these things. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. They're implacable. Yeah. There's only one thing that's going to placate those people is if you run that church and that pastor out of that town on a rail. That's it. That's it. There's no compromise with them. And you know what? Then it'll be on to the next one. And to prove that point is that, you know, I was told that now they're even going to, they're going to go and protest City Hall because City Hall's not doing anything about it. You know, the City Hall's not going to, you know, impinge somebody's freedom of, of, of religion. You know, City Hall's not going to, you know, uh, uh, violate somebody's freedom of speech. Let's go, let's go protest them. That doesn't make any sense. Look, there's a lot of things that go on in this world, a lot of things that get said and done that I don't agree with that I think are wrong, that I think are sinful. You know what I don't do is I don't get a band of people together and try to just strong arm, you know, some municipality into getting, you know, I want it my way. They're both like a bunch of kids throwing a fit. Mom, dad, so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and it's just like, mom and dad just get annoyed with that after a while. And it's just funny, this mayor thinks that they're going to, she's just going to get everybody down. You know, she's going to be this great peacemaker. And, and, and what they don't realize is the, the type of people that they're dealing with. And hopefully they start to see that. You know, hope that's the one, you know, that's one good thing about this whole situation that's going on over there. It's the fact that these people are just, you know, uh, you know, letting their true colors show, you know, no pun intended. You know, and by the and it's not all these it's not this these these eclectic colors of the flag. It's one big black flag. So it should be to like to show the blackness of their own hearts. Mm -hmm. Because they're evil, they're wicked, and they're implacable. They cannot be placated. They're not gonna. They're not gonna come to the terms at all. What'll happen is that they'll just wear out. They'll just say, you know, Sunday at ten thirty is kind of early. I'd rather stay up late Saturday night and you know and, and practice my debauchery and go back to my life of wickedness. It's usually how that kind of thing plays out, and it's just a waiting game. It's on my mind, folks. I got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, you know, I thought, hey, that's kind of, at least we know that about Saul. And we know that for other reasons about Saul. But at, at least Saul, you know, and even a man who considered David his enemy, you know, there was a line that he wasn't going to cross. He said, okay, well, he's over there now. I kind of got my way. 
and even Saul had moments of clarity, you know, where he saw things right, and, and his problem was he was not, he was not consistent. Let's go on to verse 5. It says, And David said unto Achish, I have, If I have found out grace in thy eyes, uh, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? And what we see playing out here is David is trying to be in the land of the Philistines. He's trying to be in Achish, uh, with Achish in his land. But he wants to keep Achish, you know, at arm's length. He wants to keep Achish kind of in the dark. Because we're, we're, about, we're about to read. So I believe this whole ploy about, you know, give me a royal, why should I dwell here in the royal city with you? I'm not worthy to be here. What he's really trying to do is get away. So that uh, he could continue to do what he's going to do. And Achish won't be, will be none the wiser. Then Achish, verse 6, gave Ziklag that day, gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore, Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. A year and four months. So 16 months, right? <clears throat> and, you know, this just goes to show us that a lot of things can happen in a year. A lot of things can take place. Things can change a lot. And boy, do we know that, right, in 2020. Things can change a lot in a year. And a year is a long time. It, it really is. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I know in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. But, you know, think back to when there wasn't any coronavirus. No one even heard of it. You know, that was not even a year ago. You know, that, that was, <laughs> it, it's, it hasn't even been a year, right? But that seems like forever ago, doesn't it? That seems like so long ago before the masks and the talk of the vaccines, the shutdowns, and, you know, and actually contracting it. <laughs> And knowing people that got it and so on and so forth. That seems like forever ago. It's like, it almost seems like, well, things have kind of always been this way. But it hasn't even been a year. So a lot can happen in a year. And I think that we get this time frame here to kind of show us that that's kind of what happened with David. And, you know, the, the, this length of time goes by, which is significant. And that passage of time, I think, is what kind of convinced David that his situation was permanent. I think maybe at this point David's thinking... You know, I'm dwelling in the city of the Philistines. I might as well just do my thing here. And he's probably might even be thinking he's never going back to Jerusalem at this point. And you'll see more of that in, in chapter 29, okay? When he actually is willing to go so far as to go to war against his own brethren. Because I think at this point, he's just had such a lapse, and he's been in it so long that he, you know, he's just willing to go along with the show. And just kind of, uh, he's been convinced that his situation is permanent. And it can certainly feel that way. You know, when things go on for as long as they have, you know, we might start to think, well, you know, we're just going to wear masks for the rest of our life. You know, we're just going to have to, you know, quarantine and, and, and stay away from each other forever. But, you know, this is the new normal. But it hasn't even been a year. <laughs> and people get convinced of these things over the shortest amount of time. It doesn't take long to convince people that things are permanent, that things are never going to go back to the way they were. You know, and I'm sure, you know, no, no, you know, uh, uh, no wicked government is going to let a good, you know, crisis go to waste, as they say. There's going to be changes that are made that probably are permanent to some degree. But is it always going to be the way it is? Probably not. Because here's the thing, you know, a lot can happen a year, but things can change in a day, can't they? Things can change overnight. Things can, can change very quickly. <clears throat> it says in verse 8, And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the old inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even in the land of Egypt. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive, and took the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. So this is going on. You know, David... We don't know exactly when this happened. This happened during that, that uh, you know, 16 months that he was there in that land. At some point, David just decides, I'm just going to start basically pillaging and, you know, and, and you know, it's going to be just pillaging and looting. You know, that's what's going on here. And he's going into these foreign lands and just killing everybody and spoiling them and taking the goods. And, of course, you have to, you know, in the context here, verse 10, it says, And Achish said, Whether have you made a road today? David said, against the south of Judah, and against the south of the Jeremalites, and against the south of the Kenites. So he lies and says to Achish, 
oh, I'm spoiling my own brethren. You know, I'm spoiling them in Jeru I'm spoiling them in, uh, in in Israel. That's where I'm going and getting all the spoil. He's not telling him, oh, it's the Amalekites and, and the others, because those people were in league. You know, they were they were, and it go, this goes back to the old adage. You know, the enemy the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that's kind of the play that David's making here. Hey, Akish, I'm spoiling Israel. We're buddies, right? Whereas if he knew the truth, there were probably would have been consequences. Because, you know, the same was true for Achish. You know, the Amalekites were his friends because they were enemies with Israel. You know, if, if you were enemies with Israel, hey, then we're buddies, right? So if he finds out that David, you know, is, is, is looting and killing the Amalekites, you know, those are, those are Achish's allies. You know, he's going to be upset about that. And that's why in verse 11 it says, And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gab. Right? Because we all know they just can't keep a secret. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And he says, They go bring tidings to Gab, saying, Lest they should tell on us, saying, So did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. So it gives David's motive for just wiping everybody out because he doesn't want word getting back to Achish what he's doing. <clears throat> And you say, well, that doesn't seem right. Well, you know, we have to remember that uh, who these people were, right? And Deuteronomy, if you want to go there real quick, we're almost done. Go to Deuteronomy 25. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, God definitely accepted it. Because here's the thing, and, and when, when David, you know, in two chapters later, when David decides he's going to go to war with uh, the Israelites, when he's going to join Achish in fight against his own brethren, and people say, well, he might not have. Maybe he would have a change of mind. You know, the lords of the Philistines felt that way. They say, look, he says that now. When he gets in the heat of the battle, he's going to turn on us. And that very well may have happened. But David is lying and, 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 and saying, oh, I'm spoiling my brethren uh, and not telling the truth. And he's wiping out the enemy. And here's the thing. God accepted it. You know, God didn't stop him. Whereas in 29, where he goes against his own brethren, God does bring it to an end. You know, spoiler alert. You haven't read it already. God does stop him. God does prevent him from going that far with it to where he's going to smite his own brethren. <clears throat> Look there in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Because you remember, who is it that he's picking on? It's the Amalekites. That's who he's wiping out, right? And it says in verse 17, Remember what the Amalek did uh, unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt. How he smote thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee. You know, he fought like a coward. Now, he didn't take the army head on. He routed them and smote the hindmost, even all that were feeble behind me. So these Malachites, you know, they have a history, they have a culture of being merciless cowards, is what they were. <clears throat> Remind you of anybody else that might have been talking about another night? <laughs> merciless cowards. You know, they go after the feeble. And that's exactly like these, these, these heathen hordes that are protesting out there. Yeah, I'm going to go off on it some more. Because think about what they're doing. They're attacking the most feeble among the congregation. They're, you know, they're not, they're not fighting, you know, they're not going out in the community and spreading their message and trying, you know, going door to door and trying to get people on their side. No, they're showing up where the, you know, and they're attacking like cowards and they're attacking the most feeble. You say, how are they doing that? Look, when you're going to drag that kind of filth and smut out in front of children, and you're going to say those wicked, blasphemous, vile things that cannot be repeated. Out of manners for good manners forbid it. You know, they weren't repeated to me, and even if they were, I couldn't repeat them to you because it's that vile and disgusting and wicked. Yeah. Yet they have no problems, no qualms about saying this in front of young children. And I'll never forget when we were protested up in Tempe. And those sodomites showed up with their filthy, wicked, disgusting signs and spewed their filth and their bile and everything else. You know, I went over and I thanked one of them. I said, I'm so glad you're here doing this in front of our children so that they can see that we're right about everything that we've said about you. Uh -huh. That you are filthy, vile reprobates. Yep. And they proved it to everybody that that's exactly what they were. Now, it's unfortunate that that's how my children had to come to that realization is by reading some blasphemous sign or hearing some vulgar, disgusting, vile talk. I mean, the things they're saying about people's children, it's beyond the pale. Yeah. And it shows you what's in their heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
And that's kind of, you know, I just, I'm associating everything in the story to that tonight. But I mean, it kind of fits, doesn't it? And that's the Amalekites for you. That's the heathen hordes for you. And, and you know, when, when a man of God decides to go and exact vengeance and carry out God's will, and look what he's saying here. He said, he, he's saying in verse, uh, where were we, verse 25, right? Verse 17, chapter 25, verse 17. Yeah. Remember what Analek did unto thee, by the way. He said, like, don't forget what these people are like. Remember what they're like. You know, and, and, and so many Christians today have forgotten what these Sodomites are really like. Because they don't read their Bible. It's not being preached from the pulpit. They have forgotten what they were got with the Malachites are, uh, Malachites are like. Cowards yeah. who fight and pick on the most weakest among us and go after children like the predators that they are. Amen. They come forth, and he says, they came forth by the way, how they met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he, and he feared not God. And that's these people's problem today. They have no fear of God. They have no problem just lashing out against the man of God, against a church that's doing great works for God. That, and really, what's the root of the problem? This book. You know, if, if Pastor Mejia and, you know, or any other pastor has gone through any kind of persecution of this, hadn't gone up and just said what the Bible said, there would be no protest. You know, if he just said what every other, you know, lame preacher is that, that, that is out there, oh, you know, it's a sin, we don't approve of it, but we love them. You know, they'll let that slide for now. They'll come a day when that won't even be enough. And if he'd been like that, there would have been no protest. But what happened? He had a man of God who remembered. You know, who remembered what the Amalekites are like. And this is what David did. You know, and, I, and of course, you know, got, every time you bring it up, you've got to put in this little caveat. I'm not saying that we're going to go out and fight a physical battle against the homos. As much as they would probably enjoy that. As much as they, you know, and, you know, the cops, when they're at these protests, you know, they're always on our side of the barricade. <laughs> they're always protecting God's people because we're not the ones that are going to tear people limb from limb if given the opportunity. And, and, and so on and so forth. But, <clears throat> you know, when David, he saw, he, he went and killed the Malachites, wiped them out. And again, we, that's not what we're advocating. We fight a spiritual fight. But there's this principle here. That God doesn't forget that when God marks people down, it's going to come back to them one way or another. And God let this happen to the Amalekites back in David's day because he had already marked them back in Moses' day. A long time ago, before David was even, you know, around. God is saying, you better remember those Malachites. You better remember what they did. In verse 19, therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thy enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. He's saying blot them out. What is he saying? Wipe them out. And the only reason we even know anything about the Malachites today is because it's in the Bible. And God wanted them completely blotted out. And they wanted their memory erased. They wanted them eradicated. Because of the type of people that they were. Because they deserved it. You say, well, why did God just let David go do this? Because they deserved it. Because they were already marked people. And, you know, I, I'm saying all this because, you know, I'm going to close by saying this, is that God's enemies should be careful how they treat God's people. Because God repays at some point or another. And look, these freaks over at First Works that are protesting First Works, that are going to, they're going to attack the feeble, that they're going to you know, try to make people weary, that they're going to just do everything that they're going to do and, and be, make themselves enemies of God's people. They're making themselves enemies of God. And look, it might not come in our lifetime. It might not come. They might live out the rest of their vile, wicked life on this earth and die of some disease like the vast majority of them do because of their filthy death style. They might reach that end. But you know what? God's still going to remember after that. And there's, you know, there's a special place in hell for people that will do the type of things that they're doing. That are going to defile the minds of young children. There's a special place in hell for you. I believe that. Right. And the Bible teaches that there are degrees of punishment in hell. And, and all I'm saying is this. You know, you say, oh, the poor Malachites. Why did David do that? They were already marked. He's, God wanted them wiped out. And, and I'm just saying this. is That God will avenge his people eventually. Look, it did, you know, the people that, that were physically, that actually were there 
when they were, you know, when they were coming out of Egypt, those people that were this actually were the ones attacked by the Amalekites. They didn't see it happen in their day. They didn't get to see the Amalekites wiped out, blotted out their memory from under heaven. But you know what happened eventually? And what happened, they were up in heaven and they said, finally. You know, and, and we see that in Revelation. When we go through the great people that go through the great tribulation, they're going to come to a point and say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does the Son out avenge our blood upon the earth? You know, the one, people that persecute God's people. They need to realize something is that they're going to get it one. It's coming. It's not a question of if. It's a matter of when. And that's it. So they can go ahead and they can have their their moment in the sun. You know, they can go ahead and have their you know five minute hit piece on the the, the local channel eleven or whatever it is. They can go ahead and have their their petition with fifteen thousand. So they can go ahead and have that. They can go out there and spread their filth and show everybody what they're made of and think they're getting away with it, but they better mark it down that one day God is going to repay them. Amen. You know, we might not see it in this generation, but he, and like I said, even if they end up living in full, uh, you know, a regular life and it never comes, it'll, it'll come to them in hell. <laughs> you know, and that should be a solace to God's people. Amen. That should be, a, 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 you know, that should allow us to just let them go about and do what they're going to do and not have to feel like we have to take matters into our own hands. <clears throat> because God will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So David, he get, you know, he, he wipe, he's wiping them out, right? He's wiping out the Malachites and so on and so forth. And then he's telling Achish one thing while he's doing another. But at verse 12 it says, And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him, Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. And that's really just wishful thinking on Achish's part. Because at this point, if you remember, David's got quite, you know, quite the reputation, right? in a good way. He's known as a, a mighty man of God. He's known as a warrior, right? He's the one that's leading armies and, and, and wiping people out. He led the charge against the, the Philistine and so on and so forth. You know, but uh, Achish here, he's kind of fooling himself. You know, that, that's not how things are going to play out. He's not going to be a servant forever. But it does go to show us that maybe that's what David wanted him to think. Is that, hey, I'm here forever. I've kind of resigned myself to just be here. And, you know, I'll go mess with the Amalekites and wipe them out and take their spoils and things like that and kind of fulfill that prophecy from Deuteronomy. But, you know, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be Achish's boy or whatever. And, uh, you know, and why is that? Because of the fact that, you know, David is a man like anybody else. And when he went through hard times, when he went through persecution, you know, he had a breaking point. He had a point where he kind of just threw his hands up and said, well, I guess there's nothing better for me to do than just go back in the land of the Philistines and carve out a living there, you know, doing, doing whatever I got to do. And, uh, you know, the thing that we want to emulate in the story is not that. We want to emulate the fact that even in spite of his flaws, there were 600 loyal men. Even when times were tough, People remain loyal. That's what we want to glean from the story tonight. You know, and hopefully, the, you know, these other details about the Amalekites and vengeance and all that, you know, that'll be an encouragement to us. But it should encourage us to do what? To be loyal. To be loyal. And, and, and when and we see people, our friends, fellow churches, maybe our own church, our own leadership, our own, you know, brethren, going through hard times, whether it's persecution from the world or whatever, you know, that's not the time to be ashamed of them. That's the time to come stand alongside them, to help them, to stand with them, and be a blessing to them, to be a refreshing to them, because that's when they need it most. Let's go ahead and pray.